Mark Palmer is a managing director as well as an analyst of fintech and digital assets at PTIG. It's good to see you. And and which is it? Is it the China crackdown that's going to forbid the the use of cryptocurrencies in normal exchange, or is it you pointed out some people were just taking their profits to pay their taxes? Well, I, uh, first of all, thanks very much for having me. I think it's important to note that there really hasn't been a new crackdown on cryptocurrency by the Chinese government. All we saw was a reiteration of uh, bans that have been in place uh, as long ago as 2013. Um, three Chinese government agencies came out and reiterated those bans. Um, as far as, it, as financial institutions uh, trading or facilitating the trading of cryptocurrency is concerned. So that really isn't new news. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of uh, what, what folks in the crypto world call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's out there. That's just part of it. Um, it is, uh, a, I believe, important to note, though, that this year tax day was May 17th. And what we have seen in past years is that, uh, typically speaking, if there's been a run-up in the price of cryptocurrency and investors are sitting on big gains, then they're going to be facing taxes on those gains and often sell their cryptocurrency in order to pay those taxes. Now, that's exacerbated a bit this year uh, simply because the IRS is beginning to actually focus on collecting uh, on uh, some of those gains. Uh, for the first time this year, the IRS has actually explicitly put on page one of the standard tax form, did you uh, buy or sell cryptocurrency during the past year? So, Mark, it sounds like you don't think that this is going to be long-term damage then for the crypto market, and we should see Bitcoin resume its trade higher. Well, I think what you've seen here is uh, an unwinding of a significant amount of leverage in the system. Um, you know, what, what we were um, seeing uh, in the last 24 hours was liquidations, you know, which, which are part of that unwinding. Um, from a fundamental standpoint, um, taking that leverage out of the equation um, you know, provides uh, more of a floor on which you can begin to see appreciation occur again. What I think is really important to note, though, um, bigger picture from a secular standpoint, is that the uh, wave of adoption um, from retail and institutional investors is really in the early innings still. And what we're particularly interested in is what's happening on the institutional side. And, you know, we've seen for weeks now headlines about large institutions whether those be multi-strategy hedge funds or big mutual fund complexes that are ramping up uh, to have um, uh, DeFi and crypto funds, uh, those haven't even occurred yet. So the wave of institutional money, it hasn't occurred yet, but it's coming. Well, Mark, those institutions are companies actually that will accept, for instance, Bitcoin, um, Tesla up until recently. Doesn't this open the wound that if you're going to take crypto, you could get burned when you see such a dramatic drop? I mean, if you're giving me 80,000 worth of Bitcoin to buy something, and then the next day that 80,000 is only worth maybe 45,000, what's the incentive for companies just to continue accepting this as payment? Well, I think it's it's much bigger than merchant acceptance of cryptocurrency. I think that's an important uh, development that's occurring. And you know, we cover PayPal, and one of the things that we're watching closely is uh, PayPal's effort uh, to uh, reach out to its merchants around the world and facilitate the increased adoption uh, of um, cryptocurrency uh, acceptance by merchants. Um, but what I'm really talking about is even bigger than that. It's about institutions that are trading in equities and fixed income and commodities uh, and other asset classes, adding cryptocurrency as a new asset class to their mix. Uh, this means that um, some of the most sophisticated investors in the market um, are getting ready uh, to put on trades associated with cryptocurrency. You know, so that in and of itself um, you know, could uh, lead to much more significant demand, not only for Bitcoin, but I think for um, all of the cryptocurrencies uh, uh, across the board, you know, one of the things that we've seen is that there's an, a tremendous amount of excitement about what are known as proof of stake cryptocurrencies. These are cryptocurrencies in which uh, the uh, projects are being built on the underlying blockchain and the cryptocurrencies are effectively, you know, the tickets for admission uh, to those projects. Um, you know, blockchain in itself uh, is um, in its infancy really as it pertains to the building of these projects many of which um, have the potential to disintermediate um, incumbent firms uh, in the market. Um, so the, the concept 
of the value of these cryptocurrencies being driven by the growth of development of these projects is, is pretty interesting to a lot of institutional investors. And again, you know, that money hasn't yet really flown into the market yet. Hey, Mark, so when we take a look at the Bitcoin price, say six months, seven months from now, when we're at the end of the year, what, what do you think that number is that we will be looking at? Well, I, I will say that, um, you know, BTIG has a 12-month uh, price target of $50,000. Our uh, chief strategist, Julian Emanuel, has said that. Um, you know, with that said, um, you know, to me, it's not so much about where the price is going to be at that point. The question is really how many more uh, companies, institutions, individuals are going to be involved in the space, because that's what's going to create the basis for long-term appreciation. 